first of all, obviously, uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And um, I want to begin by asking you if you remember the first time you tried acting, even if it was just messing around for fun at home or whatever, and then also if there was a moment after which you knew that this is what you were going to do for the rest of your life. Well, m my, my mother was uh, one of those mothers at the time whose child was a genius. It was a period when, when every Jewish child was a genius. And, and so she had put me through the Art League. She had had me at the Metropolitan Ballet when I was four till I was nine. And she had me at Juilliard. I went to Juilliard after high school for a year and, uh, and that didn't work out. And so when I was about 16, we found the neighborhood playhouse. And so it was when I was in Sandy Meisner's class, who had been uh, one of the members of the group theater and one of the purveyors of the method, along with Stella Adler and, and, and Louis Strasberg, that I had found my fit. I was home. And I was learning the things that I needed to learn for the first time. I could put everything into acting. And uh, at that early stage, was the goal, the ultimate thing to be a theater actress, or did it occur to you that maybe film would be something you'd want to do as well? No, film didn't occur to me. It was really theater. It was, um, I, I was raised on 148th Street and Riverside Drive. I'm an Upper West Sider. I live still on the Upper West Side. Uh, everything focused around New York. I'm a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. a and, New York. I'm sorry, well, no. uh, so I believe your first part here in New York in a play was in Detective Story. And I just wonder how that came about because obviously over the ensuing years, you would become in multiple ways very closely associated with that project. Well, um, I was working with Sidney Lumet, um, and he, he put on a couple of plays, and uh, Henry Fonda was in the audience, and he spoke to Sidney Kingsley, who wrote and directed Detective Story. And so I went to, I went to read for Sidney Kingsley, and it was for the part of the ingenue. And the lines were so silly to me that I asked if I could read for the old lady. The shoplifter was described as 40. <laughs> and, and, and so I had these characters that I had explored for the neighborhood playhouse. And, and I brought one of those characters to Sidney Kingsley and he said, yeah, you've got the part. And it was a little part. And so I never expected it to have the kind of impact that it did. Um, and the impact that it eventually did, I guess, was that at the age of just 22, you get asked to be a part of the film as well. Just you and I think two other cast members, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, and, and so uh, the three of us went to Hollywood and made the film. And out of that film, that little part in that film, uh, I was nominated in 1952 for an Academy Award. And in 1952, I won the Cannes Festival Award for Best Actress. Could you believe it? I, well, you know, neither of them had an impact on me because I was a New Yorker. And I didn't even know what the Cannes Film Festival I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't really know what it was. And, and the things that Walter said, you know, in New York, you didn't have a connection to Hollywood. You went to the movies, and you saw other actors act in movies. But your concept of ever being a part of movies just had no reality for me. So, uh, it's interesting that out of you know winning the Best Actress Award at Cannes, getting nominated for an Oscar with in some great company, Joan Blondell, Mildred Dunnick, Thelma Ritter, 
Kim Hunter, who eventually won for Streetcar Named Desire. Not bad company. Uh, from that, uh, were there immediately any? Was there immediately any impact to your career? Any opportunities that were presented before things took a darker turn shortly thereafter, or or was it so? Did that happen? Uh, the dark stuff so soon after that you didn't really feel much of an impact. Well, after I left Detective Story to do a play called All You Need Is One Good Break, which was written by my husband-to-be, Arnold Manoff, who I met, I read the play and left Detective Story with all the actors and directors saying, you don't get a hit like this, but once in a lifetime, don't leave. But I liked the writing of it, and I left. And, and Arnie Manoff was a lefty. And so, and so I became associated with him. One of the actors in All You Need Is One Good Break was J. Edward Bromberg, who had been a group theater actor. And I played with, with him, with Joe, and I did stock with him. And he was always so frightened, and he said, you know, the committee is calling me again, my heart can't take it, my heart can't take it. And it, like, opened me up to, like, what are these people blacklisted for? What, why are they coming to New York? What, what's happening there? Because I had no experience with politics at all. N newspapers weren't read in my house, except if my mother wanted to read about the sales and what was going on. But nobody ever read a newspaper, and and this suddenly these actors who I thought so highly of were such remarkable actors were running and were afraid and were sick, and and Joe left New York right before he was called again to testify before the House and American Activities Committee, and he was a big hit in London. And then the next thing I heard was that he died of a heart attack. And I had gone on to like two other plays in New York because I was a very employable young actress. And while I was in one, called Lo and Behold, I was asked by friends of Joe if I would say something at his memorial, which was at the Edison Hotel. It was a huge affair. There were like 2,000 people there. And the big thing was that Clifford Odets was going to be there, the guy who wrote for the group theater, who wrote Waiting for Lefty. And so everybody came in to hear what Clifford would say about Joe Brown. And I'd never spoken in public. And all I could say was that Joe was frightened of the committee, and I felt it had something to do with killing him because he had a bad heart. And I was very nervous. I'd never spoken in public before. And then later at the end, the last person to speak was Clifford Odette. And he got the crowd just on their feet and wanting to follow him. And, and you know, this whole thing of, of the blacklist and being against Joe and all that was like, it was like so exciting to be there. And two days later, I went into an actor's equity meeting, and the guy in front of me turned around and said, I, I see you've made it to Red Channels. And I said, what's that? And it had listed me being one of the speakers at Joe Brownberg's memorial, and what I said. And from that day on, for 12 years, I couldn't work in film or television. I was blacklisted from that minute on. And Clifford Odets, a week after making that speech, testified in front of Hueck and gave names. Unbelievable. So these bizarre juxtapositions, I mean, the people you worshipped, and he was there, you know, whipping people up into, you know, yeah, we don't have to take it anymore. And that he was so crippled inside. I feel so bad for him. Now, for people who may not know because they're too young or they just didn't know this level of depth, level of detail about the situation, can you explain what Red Channels was and how it 
was used in, in terms of blacklisting people? First of all, there was the House on American Activities Committee, and there was Joseph McCarthy who had his own committee. This was nationwide. And the people who were blacklisted in California, in Hollywood, the people they went after in Hollywood were famous writers, famous actors, Larry Parks being the first actor to get in front of the House on American Activities Committee and be stunned by their asking him to name everybody that he saw at his Communist Party meetings. Larry Parks was a big star then. And from the time that he felt cornered into that position, he lost everybody except his wife and kids. The Communists hated him. The studio would have nothing to do with him. So, I mean, these were tragedies when people open their mouths to implicate other people and give their names to the committee. And those names would be gathered as well on lists like Red Channels? Red Channels would be a pamphlet? Okay, let me just make the sure, difference. Please, sure. There was a difference between nationwide blacklisting and the blacklisting in New York. In New York, there were two guys who did all the blacklisting. One was Vincent Hartnett, who was the editor of Red Channels, who had started conferring with FBI guys and started his own magazine, which became very, very uh, profitable for him. He was also the head of something called Aware Incorporated, which all of the after board, the president of the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, was a member of Aware Incorporated. So the situation in New York was that these actors blacklisted their own. And Vincent Hartnett got money every time he said an actor should not be hired or should be hired. And he didn't say it because they were communists, because he didn't have any idea who was a communist and who wasn't. There weren't that many communists who were actors. What he did was, if they gave money to a cause that he said was lefty, if, if uh, they spoke at a memorial like I did, if uh, they signed a petition for somebody who he was against, it could, be, it could be any, if they got up in the union and spoke against the blacklist, the president of the union and the board members would give the name of person who spoke at the union to Vincent Hartnett, who would then give it to the blacklisting office at CBS, NBC, ABC, and say, I don't think this person should be hired. So Vincent was the one in New York. Who was the other? Did you mention? The other was this guy who was a grocer from Syracuse. I was doing um, a soap. Suddenly, I just got a part in, in like the days of your lives, something like that. And it was live and it went into everybody's homes and I had a part where I was poisoning the leading lady and so the last shot you would see of me, her friend Rose, poisoning the soup. And I was getting paid for that. I was getting a salary for it. Suddenly they get a letter from this guy in Syracuse I have to ask Roberta what his Lawrence name is. Lawrence Johnson. What was it? Lawrence Johnson. Yeah, Lawrence Johnson. Lawrence Johnson was this uh, Syracuse grocer. And the director told me that the sponsor, who was Crest Toothpaste, got a letter saying, I am, if you don't fire Lee Grant, communist-leaning Lee Grant, I am going to put something up under Crest Toothpaste which says, if you buy this product, you are supporting a, a, a product which employs people who are communistic, like Lee Grant. And of course, he went from floor to floor in, in, on Madison Avenue saying, you know, if you do this, I'm going to, you know, uh, get Lipton tea in trouble. If you do this, I'm going to get, you know, 
whatever you scrub with in trouble, soap in trouble, so that they, the, the guys in advertising were like totally uh, frightened by this because they represented products. And he was attacking the product for employing people like me. So it was not anything that had to do with the House and American Activities Committee or what they've been doing in Hollywood. This was a special kind of witch hunt in which two guys were making a lot of money, especially Hartnett. The other story was that Kim Hunter, who had been in um, streetcar, suddenly found that she wasn't working for somebody who had been celebrated. And so she went to Hartman and she said, you know, what's the matter? He says, oh, there have been a lot of things. You gave money here, you did something there. Um, we want you to appear at an after meeting and say that you support Aware Incorporated. And she said, I can't do that. He said, well, when they have a vote on Aware, I want you to send a telegram. She gave him 200 bucks. That was the price. She sent a telegram saying she supported Aware Incorporated, which had to have been a really rotten thing for her to feel, to have to do. And she was cleared. So it was a, a very, very muddy situation, a, a kind of rotten situation. And my job during those years, the 12 years that I was blacklisted, was to get another board to run for AFTRA and to get rid of the board that blacklisted in AFTRA at the time. Now, what I think we should make clear, because your situation in this way was a little unusual, is that you as, as we've indicated, were blacklisted before you were ever called before HUAC. Eventually you were, but by that point you were already blacklisted. You had no incentive to nothing, do anything. Nothing to lose. Right. Nothing to gain, nothing to lose. So can you explain, first, when, when I believe in 1957 you did get a subpoena to go. At that point, did you go, and what was that, what was that day like, the room? What was going on on that day? Well, I was married to Arnie Manuel by that point. Arnie Manoff, who had been the playwright that I'd left Detective Story for. And Arnie Manoff was a lefty. I can't say a communist because it's still like naming names to me. <laughs> you know, I, I have such a resistance. For a long time, even when I was off the blacklist, I couldn't say anybody's name. I, I still can't introduce one person to another. And when I was on stage and had to say names, I had to write it in ink. I had such fear of saying somebody's name and that they wouldn't work that it affected me, it, you know, really terribly, deeply, still it does. So um, I was in a play at the time. I was in Hole in the Head. I, I'd gone from one play to another, playing the leads. While you had been blacklisted. While I was blacklisted in television and films, I was working all the time in the theater because Actors' Equity and the producers of Broadway theaters agreed that there should be no blacklist in the theater so that those of us who couldn't work in film or television had a long life on the stage. And I always worked. Anyway, I was in a, a play called Hole in the Head then, and I saw these guys following me to rehearsal, and I knew that, you know, they subpoenaed me, and I had to appear. And I had a, a lawyer at that time, Leonard Boudin, who was a very famous lefty lawyer, who felt that considering the fact that I was married to a man of the left, since all of his friends were writers like Walter Bernstein, Ring Lardner, Dalton Trumbo, Ian Hunter, all writers. I had so much Julie Dask, I had so much respect, and, and I felt so lucky to be in their company. I felt so lucky to be a part of this group. He felt that I should take 
the Fifth Amendment because I didn't know enough. I wasn't smart enough to spar with these guys. And I wasn't like a Lionel Stander who, who wanted to go and, and fight them. I just wanted to get away with it mm -hmm. and go back to the theater. And um, our producer, Robert, what was his name, Roberta? Uh, you know, I, 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 I have a thing on names. That's OK. I went to our producer, Paul, in the head, and I said, I'm subpoenaed. I'm going to go up in front of the House American Activities Committee. I'm going to take the fifth. I know that this might draw attention. You know, you might have uh, groups or, or, or people coming to protest my being on stage after this. So, you know, if, if, if you want to replace me, I understand. And he said, I get so moved. He said, you, your part is here. Just do what you have to do. Come back. And the people who I met under these circumstances were such stand-up people that there was never a temptation to go any place else. I admired them. I loved them. When I went in front of the committee, I told Leonard Boudin I was a communist. And he said, well, what meetings have you gone to? You know, what have you been told to do? And I said, well, I haven't gone to any meetings. I haven't been told to do anything. This is, you know, the work in the union I'm doing is something I want to do. He said, Lee, you're not a communist. I'm sorry to tell you. Um, and so... Because you hadn't really been going through I had not my, my husband, Carney, had said to me when I was in the foyer of our apartment, you know, I think it would be a good idea for you to join the party because it would make our friends feel more secure. And I said, yeah, it made sense to me. So by the time I reached the kitchen, I thought, that was easy. Sure, I thought he was God. I thought he could make me a communist, you know, like that. And so when I went to Washington and went into that hearing room, the first thing I remembered was a guy sitting up on a kind of tier, and he said to me, what, what's a nice little girl like you doing in a place like this? And I said, well, what are you doing in a place like this? He was part of this committee. And, and so, Boudin advised me that I could answer anything in the present, but if there was anything in the past that could involve other people, that I should say I'm taking the Fifth Amendment because it could open me up either to jail on the one hand or to being forced to say something about other people, which I wouldn't go to and I didn't want to cross it. It was like this tricky road to go down to where if they say, are you a communist? I could say, I am not. Are you in a play? Yes, I am. Um, who was it that you saw on Saturday? I refused to answer on the grounds. I mean, it didn't make sense. It was like being in Wonderland, being Alice. And ultim I'm sorry. No, ultimately, they wanted you to really, they're what they were really after, because you were already blacklisted. They were not going to, the main thing, they wanted to, you to name your husband, right? And not in, not in, you know, they were very stupid. They wanted me to name Sidney Lamette, who was the director of the television show Danger, when I appeared on it. They asked me about all the other people that I knew the names. They asked me a lot of names of people that I worked with in the union. And they say, do you know John Randolph? Yes, I know John Randolph. Do you know whether John Randolph was a communist or not? I refuse to answer on the grounds of... And 
when they came to Sidney Lamette, that was who they really wanted because he was a very big director in television at the time. But they didn't. They they said, "How did you get your present job? You know, the play I was acting in." And I said, "What do you mean?" And they said, "Did a communist arrange for you to get your employment on Broadway?" I said, "I don't know what you're talking about. Are you talking about an agent?" who's a communist, because the William Morris Agency got me my job. Um, they were so out of it. They knew nothing about television. They knew nothing about theater. The way it worked, yeah. Do you remember who was asking you the questions? Uh, well, one of them was Mr. Shearer, S-H-E-E-R-E-R. -E -E and then there was another guy. I have the... Um, I have the, uh, yeah. Transcript, yeah. I have the transcript. You know what's amazing is that, you know, people often say nobody wants to be the last soldier killed in a war. It's just so pointless. I mean, all of it is, you could argue, is pointless. But to be the last guy when it's basically over is terrible. You were essentially the last person called before the committee. It's so unnecessary. I mean, you were already implicated. It wasn't going to make a difference, but there... It's just interesting to be the last. I was last. the last person they thought was a communist. Right. And I was the last person let off the blacklist because Walter was talking about, he was working in 1960. I, I did not get off the blacklist till 1964. In 1962, CBS called me in, called my agent in, they were getting rid of all their blacklisting people. And they said, let's call the Un-American Activities Committee and get you off the blacklist and get you working, Lee. By that time, I had split with my husband and I was raising my daughter on my own and they knew that I needed work. I was a working mother. And so they called the, the, uh, the Un-American Activities Committee and they said, not until she names her husband, Arnie Mann. And the CBS person said, but a wife isn't allowed to testify against her husband. I mean, they, the CBS people, were sticking up for me. They were shocked. And they said, but you know, why? Let her go back to work. They said, not until she names Arnie Man. So I went to my lawyer, Leonard Boudin, I said, what do I do? He said, try and find a lawyer in Washington who's connected, who's a middle-of-the-road guy, not associated with me like a lefty lawyer. And so I came to know uh, the lawyer who represented Hubert Humphrey at the time. His name was Max Campbell. And in 1964, an American Activities Committee sent a letter to the networks and said I could work. And it was something as simple as he was owed a favor, right? He was, exactly. Exactly. They told him no, too. But the head of the Un-American Activities Committee asked Max for something and he said, I'll do it for you if you let me go. And by that time, I don't know who was even left on the very few actors who were blacklisted ever really made it back, and almost none that I can think of made it bigger after being blacklisted than they had been before. Yeah. And yet, you did just that with, uh, you know, when we previously spoke, you called it your decade after you were... Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if you can just explain what took place in that decade when you were now off the blacklist, back in business, you were pretty embraced, weren't you? I, well... I think that, you know, that there was such a separation still between New York and Hollywood. It's not that they had computers where everybody in the studio knew about all of us in New York. They were like different countries. Hollywood and Broadway were like different countries. And so I was like a new girl in town. And my agent took me out of uh, Shakespeare in the Park, away from Joe Papp and said, don't argue with me, I have taken Peyton Place 
for you. And you, you have to, I said, I'm supposed to open in a play, in a Shakespeare in the Park. She said, you have to take it. You have no money. You have a daughter to support. You have to do it. And when I went into Peyton Place, it was like jumping into not only a different world. I mean, I had a house with a pool in Malibu. It was like a miracle. And I guess the reason this could happen is because when you had first been blacklisted, you were so young that when you were off the blacklist, you were still very young. I was, I, I think I was the only blacklisted, certainly woman, to make it, to have a career, again, to have the kind of career I had after the blacklist. Because it was 12 years of blacklisting and then 12 years of really and as you'd said when we spoke before, those 12 years that they robbed you of were essentially your ingenue years, but when you came back, can you list off starting with, well, I just let me list off and then I'll ask you to comment, but I mean, after Peyton Place, in the heat of the night, the landlord, first of all, in the heat of the night, Golden Globe nomination, the landlord, Oscar nomination, shampoo, Oscar, uh, Voyage of the Dam. Oscar nomination. This was and a bunch of Emmys and a bunch of Emmys, all within a decade. Yes. Yeah. And what all for you? That what talk about that? Just a decade of work. What those projects meant to you? Well, also you have to understand how motivated I was. I had a rage. I had a rage going against those people who not only blacklisted me, but blacklisted people who committed suicide, who died, the Julie Garfields, the, you know. I had such a rage, and I had 12 years to make up for it. And nothing was going to stop me. I was, you know, motivated is not the word. I was empowered. And, and I think that the, the producers and the directors there, had a very good feeling about trying to get me back and trying to make up for the things that they couldn't do because they knew that I was, you know, just stepped on all over the place. Can you talk about reaching the top of the mountain? I watched this morning uh, the video of your Oscar win and going oh, up you? there with, with your, you were uh, joking about your dress and that, you know, people that had been for like a quarter of a century, people that had been uh, good to you in this industry, and you thank this industry. Basically, it seemed like that was representative of the way that you felt, where you were less about focused on the past or the negative parts of it. You seemed to always uh, be able to be optimistic and, and positive. And so what was that moment where the industry that had sort of shunned you now embraces you in the most uh, profound way that they can? What was that moment like? Well, the first thing I, I, I heard was, and the winner is Lily Tung. <laughs> so, and she was sitting right in front of me with a silver crown, and so I bent forward and I said, congratulations, you know. And she said, Lee, he said, your name, <laughs> say mine. I said, what? They did? And I would see people kind of looking at me, you know, like, really? Me? And it was like, well, it was like I was the bride. I was the bride. I was going down, I was wearing my wedding dress and my little flower, and, uh, and I realized I had no more enemies. And I, I felt, you know, that this whole big room was like raising me up and saying, you made it. We're behind you. We love you more than your mother does, you know. It was a great feeling. So in closing, um, do you ever, you know, all these years later, things, we know things worked out well, very well. But does a part of you, first of all, wonder how things might have been different had this never happened, this 12-year chapter of your life? And B, 
maybe does a part of you is a part of you almost glad that it did because it shaped the person that you are today. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I the the blacklisting years were my education. I was a very stupid kid. Uh, I lived at home. I had never had a checkbook. I never had a bank account. All of that was done for me. I never washed a dish. I never. I was a very spoiled, deliberately spoiled girl, so I would be dependent on my mother. This pushed me out into the world in a very shocking way, but it was the making of me. And as you know, I became a documentary filmmaker, and and from not being able to from having to watch everything I said to being able to make films about the things I cared about, um, the issues I cared about, because I was so afraid of saying things because I thought it would, you know, stop me, that, it, that they blacklist me again, that the FBI would get me or that I'd hurt somebody else, I was always afraid I'd hurt somebody else, that I was finally free to, to make films about the things I cared about, that I learned to care about through the blacklist. Well, it's, uh, it's an amazing story, and I thank you very much for being patient enough to tell it to us. It's really uh, it's great.